As you pointed out, it's been over 50 years since the U.S. has put anything on the moon. And this is the very first time a commercial company has successfully created a spacecraft and landed it on the moon. So this is a big, big deal. Uh, as you pointed out, other people have tried and failed. Other nations recently, including Russia, tried and failed to put yeah. a lander on the moon. And so for this company to succeed uh, really says a lot for their engineering and the, the talented folks working there. And I think the future yeah. is going to be bright. They're, it's conducting a number of different experiments now and measurements uh, and will continue to do so. The other significant piece of this is that they landed near the South Pole of the moon. Only that's India right. has done that, and that was recent as well. Talk to us why, why that's significant. Obviously, the public-private partnership is very real in space. Elon Musk has proven that to us. SpaceX with a long history working with NASA. Uh, but this expands the picture. And to your point, it's bringing us to a different place on the moon than we've ever been. That's right. So NASA is interested in the South Pole region because it appears to be abundant with with uh, um, you know ice water, particularly down in some of the craters like Shackleton Crater, which never sees the sun. So the temperatures are very low there, and that's wow. where NASA will probably want to establish a lunar base in the future for sustained exploration of the moon. The reason water is important, wow. of course, we need water for life. You know, it'd be nice to have not have to bring all your water with you uh, on your expeditions. But beyond that, looking into the future, water can also be separated into hydrogen and oxygen, creating the potential, the potential for uh, future rocket fuels, right? And so a lot of exciting things happening there. Also, even though we're on the South Pole, we are in a region where it's always facing the Earth. That is the moon base and the spacecraft always mm -hmm. see the Earth. And that means you have uninterrupted communication between the vehicle or your future, future lab and uh, the Mission Control Center. This is incredible. Commander Chow is speaking to our future here to go beyond the moon, of course. And I'd love to hear you talk uh, about that, Leroy. The moon is not only a research station, but a gas station, a way station on the way to other planets. Well, that's right. And so liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen are, are you know, rocket fuel. They can be rocket propellant. Uh, it was certainly used on the space shuttle uh, for many, many years as the main propellant for the main engines, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. But of course, those were loaded here on the Earth. If we can launch uh, empty spacecraft or nearly empty spacecraft and refuel them in space or even near the moon or yeah. even on the moon, uh, then we've created the potential to go much farther into space. So current architectures don't envision or don't rely on uh, taking the water ice from the moon and converting it into rocket propellant, but it certainly is something that's possible for the future. Fascinating. This uh, lander uh, here specifically uh, from Intuitive Machines will someday have people on board. Now that we've proven its ability to land safely uh, as an empty spacecraft, how soon will that happen where we have a private mission putting human beings on the moon? Well, as you know, you mentioned SpaceX. They're not sitting still, uh, working very hard yeah. to uh, develop the and, and prove out the Starship and the Falcon Super Heavy Booster being designed as a fully reusable system. In fact, Elon Musk says one day a version of the Starship will take around 100 people at a time to Mars. In the more near term, uh, SpaceX is one of the contractors that NASA has brought on board to create a lander to land humans back on the surface of the moon based on their Starship technology. Uh, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin is part of another group that was also receiving NASA funding and support to create another lander. And so, you know, this kind of the idea is you don't put all your eggs in one basket. But this new model that created the Intuitive Machines lander, uh, of course, no humans on board, but proves that this is a great model and it works. And so very exciting, as you point out, to look to the future to hopefully sooner rather than later getting humans back onto the surface of the moon. We've made the point a couple of times, uh, Commander, that this was not a first attempt. We saw a number of failed attempts most recently, just last month, actually. I forgot, this was just as recently as January. This company, Astrobotics Lander, had an engine failure just after reaching space. What did this group do right? Right. And so unfortunately, Astrobotics vehicle, once they got into orbit, there appeared to be some kind of a valving problem or or any way they had a, a burst in a, in a propellant line or a propellant tank. So they didn't have the fuel to make it to, down to the moon. 
Uh, they did manage to yeah. salvage a little bit from their mission, but, uh, you know, of course, did not land. And so uh, what Intuitive Machines did differently, I don't know the, you know, the precise uh, designs, of course, uh, but clearly they didn't suffer any kind of failure like that. They did have a few hairy moments there uh, as they were getting ready to come down their <laughs> radar system, which uh, is a ranging radar and telling them the distance to the moon. They were having some issues with that, and they actually were able to create a big software patch very quickly, test it, get it on board, and they use an experiment, a, a LIDAR, a laser ranging system, not unlike some of the ones that the police might use to try to give you a ticket here on Earth, but that was just to be an experiment. But they huh. used that for this operation to do the ranging and successfully landed on the moon with an experimental piece of hardware. Fascinating. You know, there's a real debate here uh, on Earth about where we should be spending our money and, and whether it's ethical or right to be spending money on research in space uh, when there are people starving here on our planet. We've been hearing this since before the Apollo program, Commander. When you see uh, the marriage of government and private enterprise working together here, does that change the dynamic? when it comes to money? Oh, it, it, yes, absolutely it does. And when we get into the numbers and the budget, uh, if you look at NASA, except for the Apollo program, since the Apollo program, and certainly for the last several decades, NASA's funding has generally been much less than 1% of the federal budget. And so when you say, wow, we've got all these social problems here on Earth, that's all absolutely true. That takes a huge mm -hmm. portion of the national budget every year. And so if we took that less than 1% that we're spending on NASA, and look what we get for it all the rovers that we have on Mars, the research work, the great discoveries in our solar system on the moons of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, uh, not to mention the human spaceflight program and International Space Station, all the people those programs employ, we're going to fire them all, put them all out of a job. The contractors, they're all going to go out of business. Mm. Now I've got all these unemployed people so we could save that less than 1% and put that tiny wow. drop in the yeah. big bucket of spend, spending for social programs. So it's, it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of making mm -hmm. sure that you do uh, have the right proportions uh, put into different buckets. Everyone's going to have their own opinion on that. But at the end of the day, I think the positives that come out of the space program are much, much outweigh the negatives.